have a simple book that told my students, here's the latest developments in all of these technologies we're studying, because we're studying TV, we're studying computers, consumer electronics, telephony, and networking. And there was no book. And I happened to be one of my students in my class was actually working for uh, Technology Futures. And she said, well, we do technology. Let's work together. And out of that came the Communication Technology Update and Fundamentals. We published the first edition in 1992. Little skinny paperback uh, that surprisingly sold 500 copies. And so we did another one the next year, and that sold a couple thousand copies. And we were off to the races. 30 years later. We published the 18th edition of Communication Technology Update and Fundamentals, still with the same goal. What is going on in all of these different technologies? We can't provide great depth, but we can provide an overview of not only the technologies, but the infrastructure for the technologies. Because one of the things that we found out, the big part of each chapter is the uh, latest developments in that technology. Biggest developments are always organizational change. Fundamental technology change doesn't happen very often, but the organizational change, regulatory change, uh, et cetera, happens much more quickly. So we've been doing this. Uh, we've got the uh, 18th edition. Here's a picture of it. Here is actually a real copy. I'll be giving a couple of these away at the end of the presentation. But the thing you might find of greatest interest uh, with all of the data that's been thrown up here, uh, uh, Miguel, can we go ahead and throw up the data chart? Uh, chapter two of the book is a history. Attached to chapter two is a set of charts and graphs that track every technology that we cover in the book, including books, television, cable TV, radio, uh, et cetera. This one has happens to be published book titles. Um, uh, haven't had great updates on the books. Let's page down a little bit. Uh, there we go. There's telephone and wireless telephone. Uh, again, if you're looking for a data source, we not only have the charts, but we have the raw data. And that's in our companion website, so you don't have to buy the book to do that. So just send me an email, I'll send you a link to that. But those of you who love data, I thought you, uh, you might be interested in that. But you're not here for the past. You want to look ahead to the future. So let's go back to the slide deck. And uh, uh, we'll, uh, I'll try and run through about 20 different technologies uh, in the time we have. And I'm leaving some time at the end so we have some time for uh, discussion, questions, disagreements. Uh, those are always fun. Um, there's really more action going on from my perspective in television technologies than anywhere else today. Um, we are moving from a time when broadcast and cable dominated to a time when streaming dominates. You all are familiar with all of these options. Uh, just curious, does anybody in the room subscribe to all of these? If you can see just one that you don't subscribe to, you know, all of them, there we go. <laughs> you are a hyper consumer, Alyssa. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm sorry, I did, I, whoops, I don't see your name tag behind you. Uh oh. OK, see, that's, that's what I get for trying to interact with the audience. <laughs> Don't interact with the attendees. Um, OK, so anyway, um, we see all of that going on. We are at the time of greatest change in the television industry we've had since uh, the introduction of cable television. Uh, and what's behind all of that change is the desire to move from the traditional broadcast model to streaming. Now keep in mind, from a, an economic perspective, there's nothing more efficient than broadcasting. The cost, full cost of broadcasting is in reaching the first consumer. Once you reach the first consumer, the marginal cost of additional users is zero. As opposed to streaming, where you have a marginal cost for every stream. Now as cost of bandwidth goes down, that marginal cost goes down, and you have additional economic opportunities when you can monetize the ability to target specific messages at specific people. 
So what we have in the television industry is a move to streaming because, not because it makes greater, more efficient use of the spectrum, but the streaming gives us the ability to do the targeting and to monetize. So uh, the next step in evolution, we'll see a lot of this coming in the next year or two, is packaging all of these streaming services into one service. And what do we call that? It's <laughs> cable, um, except it's going to be something different. And instead of having one choice, we may have multiple choices. So we're also going to see a lot of consolidation coming. There, frankly, are too many uh, streaming services. Uh, Disney alone, between its Disney Plus, its ESPN, its National Geographic, and ABC, it's got too many services. It will be one of the first ones we're going to see consolidating. But uh, that's a big factor coming. Uh, this is going to have a huge impact on local TV. Now keep in mind, the major function of local television is delivering consumers to local advertisers. Local advertisers, uh, if I'm opening a new restaurant, if I'm opening a new furniture store, if I'm selling cars, I have, to way to have a way to tell people, hey, I have this available to you. Local TV does that job. Um, cable TV to a slightly lesser extent because they have fewer avails and the audience is spread out over a lot more shows. But that, in order to deliver those audiences, they have to have the programming. And the networks have realized they can disintermediate by delivering streams directly to uh, the consumers. CBS, for example, has uh, Paramount Plus, or I should say Paramount Global has Paramount Plus and CBS. So I can watch my CBS programming there. I can watch my NBC shows on Peacock. Uh, and again, ABC has a streaming service. The only one who hasn't really done as well in this is Fox. But with the direct delivery to consumers, that's challenging the role of the local TV stations. So what we're going to do is see local TV stations shift a lot more to local news content with a lot of emphasis on weather because that's the number one thing people want. Um, there's not going to be an additional impact. Um, I never give financial advice, so I would not directly say sell your stock in uh, uh, local TV companies. But the fact that local TV companies have gone from getting zero revenue from cable television uh, and satellite to getting almost 20% of their revenue through the retransmission fees that Steve was complaining about yesterday, uh, this is a direct cost. I mean, back in 1992 when the Cable Communications Consumer Protection and Competition Act was passed, the thought of cable companies having to pay broadcasters a little amount every month was, well, maybe we'll get five cents, maybe 20 cents. And initially they got nothing. And then eventually they got five cents and 20 cents, then 25, then 50. It's now up to about $5 per subscriber per month per channel. Problem is, broadcasters have come to depend on it, and when people cut the cord and start picking up signals over the air, broadcasters don't have that money. So it's going to cause a huge challenge, and a huge shift will take uh, NBC Universal, for example. Huge shift in the revenues within that company because the uh, Comcast division is going to have much more revenue than the NBC division. So. Um, there's a critical impact for local advertisers. I haven't quite figured out where the local advertisers are going. We know some are going digital. But the big thing is increased dependence on live sports by broadcasting. You're going to see a lot more competition, a lot more bidding up of sports rights. Uh, and that gets really important in cities like uh, Austin, where you have the University of Texas that's going to join the greatest television, or the great, te greatest television conference, the greatest sports conference, the Southeastern Conference, I'd say television because I know the University of South Carolina got $60 million last year in payout from our deal with the SEC network. Again, lots of economics there. All right. What you don't see is ATSC 3.0. More than a decade was spent developing this advanced TV standard that would take broadcast television beyond simple high definition, give 4K capability, give HDR capability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have the ability to deliver targeted advertising. We have the ability to 
take bandwidth used by TV stations and put increase the number of TV stations in one channel so we can have more bandwidth for uh, fixed wireless or whatever uh, uh, the FCC wants to use it for. The issue is that even though it's been adopted by more than 300 TV stations and it's the last, site, uh, last one I looked up was Wednesday night, 66 markets it's in. Um, I also went to the Consumer Electronics Show earlier this month and I looked for ATSC compatible televisions. Nobody was heralding that they had an ATSC compatible television. Here's a technology that the transmission is diffusing, but the reception is not diffusing and the consumer awareness is close to zero. I would compare it to uh, HD radio. You know, that digital radio that we all have built into our dashboards that uh, we can get a much higher quality radio signal that allows radio stations to transmit multiple signals at once that nobody in the US listens to. It is a non-factor because there's no consumer awareness. So uh, this is one to watch. Um, I do have a, uh, if you really like theoretical discussions, in chapter four of the book we talk about pre-diffusion theory where we talk about all the factors that have to be in place for consumer adoption to take place. There's a huge revenue opportunity with ATSC 3.0, but right now the practical opportunity isn't there. Uh, in the meantime, Somebody uh, is in a conversation at a dinner Wednesday. Somebody said, we never go backwards. We only go forward. And I was looking at Larry's chart yesterday showing the decline in broadcast and the increase in, uh, in, the increase in streaming. Antenna use is going up. As people cut the cord, they realize if I want to watch free over-the-air TV that includes live sports, I can use an antenna. And again, Anything that's getting a 22% market share that has an increase of almost 10% in one year is something we need to watch. So those of you who are looking at bits and bytes as a way to deliver, put this on your radar. Um, broadcast TV may have a resurgence or it may have to be reinvented. Remember, broadcast radio used to do what broadcast TV does now, and then TV came along and radio reinvented itself as a music and a talk medium. So, Broadcasting is always reinventing itself. Um, we have more video devices than ever. I, I saw this stat and I just had to throw it up there. 121 million TV households in the US, but 200 and what, 225 million smart TVs. So almost two per household. And the estimate is if we look at all connected video devices, that includes our phones uh, that we use for video, the projection is there'll be 1.1 billion, almost uh, nine per household in uh, 2026. That's a lot of connectivity. So you say, well, Augie, you talked about those broadcast streams. Those are all going to be bits and bytes. So we have to realize multiple channels being used to deliver video signals. Television is in a great state of flux. It is the best uh, spectator sport there is out there, uh, much better than the NFL. So um, we talked, uh, uh, Larry talked about uh, the uh, bandwidth requirements for 8K TV yesterday. Here's a graphic illustration. You can see that, uh, you know, the amount of bandwidth to do that signal, about four times as much to do 4K and about six times as much to do 8K. Here's the issue. You can't see the difference. The only way you can see the difference between HD and 4K is if you're within two feet of the screen. The only, difference, the only way you can see the difference between the 4K and 8K is if you're about nine inches or less from the screen. Now, it doesn't mean that people aren't going to use it because Best Buy needs a reason for you to buy a new TV. And if you walk in there and they say, what, what you have a 4K TV? Do you, do you have Three, four, five K. You you are so 2021. <laughs> I'm sorry. If you're not 8K, you know your neighbors have 8K. Um, 8K is not a technology for the consumer. 8K is a technology for the television industry. So that's not a bad thing. Um, 
it has other uses, digital signage, for example, that we're going to talk about. So what's coming in TV? First, definitely higher quality displays. The plasma TVs are almost completely gone. We're slowly replacing the LCDs with the uh, OLED uh, and the other LED type screens. Um, 8K, again, great for displaying technology. Um, we'll use it in digital signage. We'll talk about that in a second. The key issue in any TV, though, is content. People will watch a very low resolution sportscast over a very high resolution uh, opera. So and that's, I shouldn't say people, I say majority of people. Some people love the opera, but they also like to listen to the opera. So again, consider the content. Watch where the content is going. That's going to be your, your big measure. Um, we have addressable advertising coming. This is part of the ATSC 3.0. So broadcasters can deliver multiple ads. The TV can pick out the ad that's right for each consumer. This gives broadcasters some of the capability for targeting audiences that we have with streaming. So uh, it represents a significant revenue potential. So far, it's not being exploited at all because, again, the consumers have no awareness that there is this technology out there. So uh, let's move to cinema. Love to talk about the movies. The Oscar nominees were, were announced uh, this week. Uh, how many of you have seen Everything Everywhere All at Once? Ah, OK. Those of you who haven't, it'll blow your mind. You got to get through the first 15 minutes, because you're going to wonder, why would anybody tell me to watch this movie? Watching the first bit. Once you pass the first 15 minutes, it'll blow your mind. OK. so. Cinema's evolution continues. The pandemic did such a job of saying, hey, we don't have to be in a theater to watch a movie. We still have theaters. The DVD and video cassette market has almost completely disappeared. It's there, but streaming is where it's at. We still have pay-per-view. We still have the secondary markets. Remember, in the cinema industry, the goal is windowing releasing the product in one place for a very high per use, then you release it in another window for a light, slightly lower cost, then another window. That's how the theatrical industry takes a single product and sells it over and over and over again. Um, it's, it's remarkable. Um, and the television networks have been basically replaced by cable networks. The only place you'll see a movie on broadcast television today is occasionally CBS during the summer will pull something out of the Paramount Library because <laughs> they got to make the economics of that merger work somehow. Um, keep in mind, we're talking about movie theaters. From a social perspective, the most important function of the movie theater is in courting rituals. It gives young people a place where two people who don't know each other, well, it could be older people too, but primarily for young people, two people who don't know each other well a chance to experience a compressed amount of time and then to see how they react to it. From a social perspective, there's no better way to get to know someone than watching a movie together and then seeing how you react to it. So, Movies are still important, and that's why the movies that target the younger audiences, they are the thrillers. They have the, uh, the, the horror, the violence, things to get your adrenaline pumping, because that's what they're looking for. So don't underestimate that. And everything, everywhere, all at once is not one of those movies that will get your blood pumping. So that's a separate subject. OK, a few details about the cinema industry to stick in the back of your mind. Always remember, half of the box office revenue is kept by the theater. And even with that box office revenue and the concessions, the theaters are struggling because they're not getting that many people to attend. Most of you who see movies probably watch them at home. Some people still love going into the theater, going into that darkened auditorium and sharing the experience with others. But we have to do that on their time. We stream it. We do it on our time, whenever we want. Um, the profit participants, this is the, the, uh, uh, the whole uh, Black Widow case. Scarlett Johansson did Black Widow and was promised profit participation, and then Disney put it on streaming where there was no box office revenue. So she was uh, uh, severely taken advantage of and sued, and they settled. Um, 
This is a big change in movie economics because profit participation is a big part of movie economics. Uh, keep in mind, movie studios, record companies have always been run by lawyers and accountants, the successful ones. The ones that are run by creative people rarely have great success. And the lawyers and accountants are always looking for a way, how can I get the most money out of everybody for myself? So that's going to continue. Again, a great spectator sport, but let's put it in perspective. I love talking about the movies, but in the big scheme of things, the movies are almost nothing. Look at this. Look at this. Movie box office, global, global, not just US, $30 billion. Video games by themselves, we'll look at that in a second, $197 billion a year. Oh, advertising industry, $600 to $800 billion a year, depending on how you count it. And <laughs> telecom, uh, more than $2.5 trillion. Um, so you say, why are we in the telecom business instead of being in the cinema business? Here's your graph. So this, this justifies all of you on the technical side. And whenever anybody starts talking about those creatives, just point to this. Um, the best is when you get somebody like TFI that bridges it. That, yeah, we do all of the entertainment from the telecom perspective. So I just I love this graph because it puts so much into perspective. Let's spend just a second on radio because radio is our oldest electronic mass medium. Um, radio in the US, local radio is still generating about $14 billion a year. More money in local radio than there is in cinema, for example. Um, but we've had this digital broadcasting, this HD radio, for more than 10 years that nobody is listening to. In the rest of the world, that's not the case. We do have digital radio in the form of podcasts, in the form of streaming services. Sirius XM has uh, uh, been providing a digital radio service, but the predominant consumption of radio in the US is still analog. So, and I like to say it's stubbornly analog. Um, just an interesting detail. I don't know how to draw any larger meaning other than yeah, it's still analog. Um, OK, let's get to the big ones, video games. 2022 global revenues for video games. This includes all of the hardware and all of the content and all of the in-app purchases, everything. About $197 billion. That's a lot of money. It dwarfs most other uh, entertainment. Um, the uh, Vir video games and VR are coming together. It used to be when you played a game, you tried to achieve a goal. Now you can play against each other in multiplayer games, and you have a choice of what you wanted to be. I put up here fluid identity. From a social and cultural perspective, the idea that when you put on a video game headset or you go into a game, you can be anything you want. You know, I can be a 28-year-old buff warrior. That's what people will see me as. That's how I'll re represent myself. Um, yeah, I want that. I, do I want to be a woman for a week? I'm not going to say now, but <laughs> my wife's in the room. So no, I don't want that. But this is a real key question, because for so long, from a social perspective, our identities have been linked to how we were born. We can now choose to be whatever we want to be. And if there's one thing that's most important to understand about the emerging virtual worlds is that identity becomes fluid. And sociologists are looking at this. They've been examining this since the creation of avatars. I had a, a student back in the 90s here at UT, Aviva Rosenstein, who was researching avatars and identity. This is a bigger and bigger issue. Uh, and all of the discussions we have about how uh, uh, kids are trying to figure out, you know, what is my gender identity, it's related to the fact that in a virtual world, you can be anything you want to be. So anyway, um, biggest virtual world video game is Fortnite. Uh, looking at this one. One game generating more revenue than any single TV network, even ESPN, uh, about $6 billion. 
390 million regular users, again, there's a critical mass thing. You get a number of, certain number of people using it, that attracts other people. It's hard for anyone to come in and compete with that over time. Um, this brings us to the subject of the metaverse. Um, I heard lots of discussion over the last uh, uh, day about the metaverse and the bandwidth requirements. I want to state that the metaverse is not here yet. The closest thing we have is Fortnite and the other virtual worlds that are all unconnected to each other. And I compare it to where the internet was in 1992. We had Prodigy, we had The Source, we had CompuServe, yeah, AOL was just starting. You could go online and be in a little world connected with a very small number of people. But when Tim Berners-Lee World Wide Web enabled these worlds to be connected, and we suddenly had an internet with email that could connect across the boundaries of the services, we really had something. We're not there yet with the metaverse. Um, the question is, are they going to be connected, these virtual worlds? I don't know the answer to that, because everybody wants to control it. That's the uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. When he took his company and renamed it from Facebook to Meta, trying to say, I'm going to control the metaverse. Um, just raise your hands if you want Mark Zuckerberg to be in charge of the future of any technology. <laughs> All right. One outlier in every room. <laughs> so, um, and the beauty of the internet is the, all of these worlds were connected, but they didn't have anybody in charge of it. One of the beauties of the internet. That also leads to other challenges. But that's one of those the factors we have to think about related to the metaverse. Now, there are some other challenges. I think the physical challenges are the biggest ones. If I'm doing a standard virtual experience with a head-mounted device, uh, standing up and trying to interact, my physical limit's about 15 minutes. That is, more than 15 minutes, you tend to become disoriented, <coughs> your chances of falling, hurting yourself become much greater. It's kind of like, kind of like having a plug on the floor and tripping over it. <laughs> Some people cannot handle being able to move around virtual worlds. Um, 15 minutes the limit. So you can sit down. So if you're sitting down, you can have a longer experience, but you can't do the same type of interaction. It's very hard to walk. You can tell your controller to make your avatar walk, but you're not actually walking. Suddenly the experience is a lot less real. So, and there's also reluctance to use HMDs. Let's consider, uh, I, I like to take lessons, from, take from one technology and apply them to another. Ten years ago, the hottest thing in television was 3D TV. Everybody was going to have 3D TV. Every manufacturer was showing 3D TV sets. And we had ones with light glasses, and ones with heavy glasses, and ones with cheap glasses, and ones with expensive glasses, and nobody wanted to wear the glasses. And then 3D technology has not been developed that doesn't use glasses. This is the holograms you're talking about, Steve. We're, we'll get there. But we're not there yet. So. The reluctance to use HMD is one of the biggest barriers to actually having a metaverse. Um, there's also a critical mass issue that a technology is only useful so long as you have a minimum number of people to interact to allow people to come back. Fortnite has that, but it's very, they can't build themselves into being everything. Meta doesn't have that yet. So it'll be interesting to watch as the critical mass develops over time. A um, couple of predictions. Uh, based on the history of the internet, the metaverse is not going to emerge as a playground. It's not going to emerge as an educational space. It's going to be uh, co-opted for commercial purposes just as the internet was. Doesn't mean it can't be used for other purposes, but the commercial is going to be there. And I think that uh, if we have a metaverse, it will use a large number of screens rather than an HMD. Because by working with screens, you can still be grounded in your own environment. You can still see what you're doing. You can have all kinds of sensors. Uh, I love uh, whoever was talking about using the high millimeter waves to actually do sensing of the body. I mean, we have great potential for that. 
Uh, one of the exhibits I saw uh, two weeks ago at CES was a virtual classroom where I put on the HMD and said, this is interesting, and the person said, now pick up the chalk. I did not have to put on a glove or any haptic device. I just had to reach out, and there was the thing, and the sensor could see what I was doing. So we have sensors that can capture it. You take that level of sensor combined with screens that surround you or screens that are stacked, you can have a virtual world. Um, but in my opinion, I added this line last night, in my opinion, it's not the killer app for 10 gigabit per second broadband. I do think there is a killer app, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, this brings us to VR. We know that virtual reality creeps along. People do weird things with it. Uh, that was at a conference we did a number of years ago. Um, the biggest development is the HMDs have become untethered. Uh, it used to be uh, when I, uh, I guess it was five years ago, I bought a set of equipment for the Center for Teaching Excellence at the university. We bought four headsets, and each headset had to come with a $4,000 uh, Dell laptop running a high-end GPU in order to operate. Now all of that can operate in a $300 uh, MetaQuest 2 or HTC Vive uh, Pro, whatever they're calling it. Um, the growth has been slow. The technology has been out there. People have been uh, able to play with it. It is not taking off. It's kind of like video conferencing in the 1990s. Every time someone had a new development, they said, this is it, the hockey stick's going to take off. Um, sat in the office of uh, uh, the president of Via Video before they were acquired by Polycom, and he showed me the chart predicting takeoff. And I showed him my chart saying, no, no, you've had this slow growth since the 1970s. I think the same thing's happening with the HMDs. Very slow growth. I could be wrong, but I haven't seen any takeoff point for that technology. Again, today, the number one use of virtual reality is for training. Uh, military uses it. There's nobody who flies an airplane that hasn't been trained on a simulator. Simulators are becoming more and more realistic. Um, police departments are increasingly using it to train in act acting and interacting. Um, so it's great for that. It's great for architecture. You design a building, you can actually walk through the building before you actually build anything and find out if there are bad angles or if when you open the front door it's actually looking into the bathroom. You know, things you may not see until you have actually built it. You can walk through any uh, plan. Um, there is an issue of accessibility. How do we help people who uh, are visually impaired, or people who may be mobility impaired? How do you work with any type of uh, access issue and make sure the virtual worlds are equally accessible to everybody? Um, and the final limitation is need for dedicated space. If I'm going to have a virtual uh, reality uh, experience, I've got to have a minimum a six by six space. And I'm, I'm experiencing this now. We're putting on a conference at uh, USC uh, in October. And uh, I've got a, uh, somebody on my team has said, okay, I've got 20 uh, Oculus headsets, so everybody can do it. And we want to, it's a VR conference, we want people to experience it. Now we have to have a place where we can set up 20 VR uh, uh, spaces that have the sensors. So, little details. Um, I think augmented reality uh, has been underused. Uh, the idea that we can overlay anything on top of a world that if I had the right glasses right now, I could look at each of you and just on the basis of detecting your uh, uh, face, it would give me information about you. So I wouldn't need the name tags. All of the information is uh, right there on my glasses. Or if I'm traveling, you know, I uh, uh, take another trip uh, to Ukraine. Uh, had, I've gone there uh, eight times in the last 15 years to train journalists. And being able to walk around with the glasses and every sign is translated into English. So it might inhibit me learning uh, the language a little, but it definitely would enable me in navigating the space. Augmented reality, I think, has great potential. Uh, and again, great opportunity for consuming bandwidth. Um, Esports is becoming big. The whole idea that uh, people can compete 
in virtual worlds. Uh, consider Twitch. We have an entire service that's devoted to letting people watch other people watch, play video games. And people love it because it is competition. The outcome is uncertain. They develop an identification with the players, the same as they might have with the athletes. So we have arenas that are being built. There's a, uh, a big arena in Los Angeles. They've just put one in the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas. Um, Esports arenas are popping up to give you a chance to go see people live competing. And your esports, uh, can we call them athletes? Performers? You know, they come in, they get the chairs, and you know, it's like walking into a boxing ring, only they walk in onto the stage, and then they take the controllers in hand. And massive video monitors, people can see all the action. Um, it's exciting. You'll know it's really hit when people start betting on it. I haven't seen the betting yet, but I do know that it's being adopted in colleges. You have a number of esports leagues that have developed, so people who are in college can compete with each other. There are collegiate tournaments. Uh, again, there's potential. This one happens to be one set up. Of course, California is ahead of the rest of us. So, uh, but there is organized competition. This is one to watch. This is one to watch. Um, digital signage. I promised I'd talk about uh, digital signage earlier because it's a use of display technology. Um, I'm actually teaching uh, a course, an entire course, nothing but digital signage. How to create it, how to evaluate it. Uh, we have, uh, we've had a chapter on this in the book for the last, uh, I guess, almost 14 years that say here are your four types of digital signage. Where do you put it? And it goes into detail on each one. I'm not, I don't have to give too many examples because you see this every day, everywhere you go. This is a technology that's embedded everywhere. Um, it has great efficiency. Once you pay that initial upfront cost to install the sign and the software, you then have the capability to do instant reprogramming. Uh, if it's on a menu board, you can change your prices. Uh, if you are at a movie theater, you can change the movie you're showing. And you can do it all remotely. And it's incredibly easy. I had uh, my students in the class had their first experience with the uh, online software. And it took them exactly 15 minutes to learn how to upload software. And in one class session, they had created their first digital signage sequence. Simple, but very powerful. Um, big concerns, uh, environmental. Uh, these things use a lot of power and can be very inefficient. There's a study out of the UK that says, in the UK, when that study was done, the average digital sign used the same amount of power, uh, I'm sorry, it's digital billboard, same amount of power as five households. That's not sustainable. So it has to be attention. There are regulatory issues, uh, again, mostly dealing with the digital billboards. You don't, don't want to be distracting. Uh, the time and place, you know, where you put it, how bright it is. Uh, and we have to look, uh, obviously, what are the functions? Most people see it as an instrumental tool, just conveying information. But anytime you have a display, you can use it for entertainment or inspiration or persuasion. So uh, I pull out this one. This is point of mind, digital signage as art. Uh, it's an artist, Rafik Anadol. We'll, uh, if we have a minute at the end, I'm going to throw up some pictures. Uh, he is a Turkish artist who is an engineer, software engineer, and he created an AI system that ingested everything in the Museum of Modern Art in New York uh, collection, uh, something like 30 million images. And then it digested them and created a series of images. It is true art. He just did another one for the World Economic Forum in Davos that took 30 million images of coral and created virtual scenes. So we'll look at some examples of that at the end. But the point is, this is an example of a technology that's really stretching what we're doing. Um, let's bring it back to what we're doing. Other things that are important. How do we measure digital signage? Two ways to do it. You have a camera that actually s identifies people. Uh, I shouldn't say camera. I should say imaging device. It's camera. Uh, or you use a phone detection. 
Uh, there's a big fight within the industry of whether you measure using a camera or whether you measure using phone detection. Both have privacy concerns, and we'll talk about some of that in just a second. Uh, what's new with computers? Uh, okay, we continue to move to the cloud. People are continuing to use laptops and tablets. The biggest thing I found is multiple monitors. Your average setup now has two monitors. You now often have three. Does anybody work with three or more monitors at their workspace in this room? None of you in high finance. <laughs> Get a Bloomberg terminal. I'm, I'm looking at the back. But this is becoming increasingly common because it expands your virtual workspace. That's the big development. OK. And that's really exciting. Um, Internet access. We know that internet access, we, this has been discussed. Uh, moving home internet from telco and cable, we see the uh, emerging 5G, the fixed wireless, and the satellite. Um, what I think is really important is passing the 90% penetration for broadband access at home. That is critical. It means we have a utility. It also means there may be different types of regulation coming. Um, but again, the penetration is probably going to peak soon, too, because there are some people who don't want it. They never want it. So um, work from home. Again, the pandemic brought this back to us. Uh, we know that there's increased remote work. Uh, we know that there is this tension. Should people be forced to return to the office? Should they be asked to return to the office? Uh, or how important is it to allow people to be geographically dispersed? You know, some, bu some businesses function perfectly well with employees in 10 different states. Some need to have the people together for training, for uh, uh, acculturation. Uh, we have to realize that business is more than achieving business goals. Part of the reason you achieve those goals is the way we act and interact with others, and some of that's interpersonal. But the biggest thing uh, I say is control and trust. There are some people who want everyone back in the office because I'm in charge, damn it. I don't happen to agree with those people. Uh, it is a trust issue. It is knowing the type of work that's being done. And we do need to have much better training of managers on how to do this. Um, ownership and payment of technology is a big thing. If I'm working for a bank and I'm working at home, that bank should be the one paying for my home router because I definitely do not want a uh, home grade uh, uh, what, uh, Netgear router sending that information through. I need something more protected. Uh, but should an employer be required to pay for the workspace at home? This will become a regulatory issue. Remember, we used to outlaw certain types of uh, forcing people to work at home, uh, doing piecework. Um, a bigger issue for me is the separation of work time and personal time. When you're working at home, how do you set up that barrier? When is it you say, I'm on the clock, I'm not on the clock, especially for those of us who are not paid uh, according to uh, a times a timesheet. So that's a big issue. Um, related to that is the definition of a workspace. If you can define a workspace, at home, go to that, that's where you work. When you leave that, you're not working. That helps you in establishing the separation. But there is a huge cultural issue, or a financial issue, of what should employers be paying for when you have work from home. Uh, learn from home. Uh, obviously, uh, we have these new, ca same capabilities that can be used in working from home, learning from home. Um, Schools don't like it. Socialization is an important part of the school procedure. Uh, the interesting thing is a number of school districts have said, we don't need to have snow days anymore. Uh, you, we, everybody can study at home when it happens. And sometimes you need a break. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to make a recommendation, but let's think. Sometimes having a break is a nice thing. Academic integrity is a big issue. I could uh, talk for an hour about academic integrity related to uh, learning from home. E-health, moving on to a totally separate topic. Uh, what do we have? Diagnosis, monitoring, treatment, payment. This could be the killer app. The fact that we have the ability to monitor any aspect of your health behavior. We have the ability for insurance companies to 
save a significant amount of money by monitoring and treatment. Uh, this is a bandwidth intensive, uh, or could be a bandwidth intensive, depending upon what is monitored, what reports are there, uh, whether you have something you're carrying with you. You know, I, I love that uh, little Cardia device that can let me see uh, my heart rate. It's as good as a six lead uh, EK, e EKG. So ECG? Which one? EKG. Yeah, I know one, one, of, one of them's the heart, one's the brain. That's, I don't have much of either, so. Um, again, don't underestimate the potential, especially with the amount of money. I showed you the size of the telecom. I should have put health on that graph because it would dwarf telecom. So there's a great potential for everything we're doing in e-health. Um, social media, I'm going to uh, buzz through this. We know Twitter has its problems. Uh, it has a big Elon problem. We know from critical mass people are leaving Twitter in droves. And I have, will guarantee you, Twitter is going to be replaced because of critical mass issues by Twitter. Twitter will be reinvented. It's going to stick around. Um, again, if I had more time, I'd go into more detail. A lot of issues with the uh, negative impacts. Uh, we know the impact it's had on politics. We also know that there have been studies that Facebook deliberately emphasizes things that will raise people's anger or incite emotions because they know that increases the time spent. Their goal has been a singular goal, maximize the time you spend on it. So their algor algorithm is designed to make you mad because um, they make money when you're mad. Um, and you say, that's not a good thing. Well, Chili's makes money when you're hungry. They want to show you an ad that makes you hungry. You know, I'm not here to moralize about them. Uh, I do think this is something we have to watch, and there will be new regulation coming out. Uh, Meta has been the, uh, the biggest one. The pivot to the metaverse, I don't know, has been well thought out. I know that Zuckerberg has a vision. Um, he had a vision for Facebook. I don't know if his vision extends to what's going on in metaverse. There are definitely challenges in advertising and the negative impact. I think antitrust is the biggest issue they have, though. I think eventually one company can't own Facebook and Instagram uh, in a country that has uh, antitrust laws. And that's just due to the uh, control. Not not. It's not consumer related, it's related to the digital advertising industry. When one company becomes the outlet for uh, more than 40% of the digital advertising, that's a problem. Uh, so regulation coming in social media, we have antitrust regulation, there are concerns about children. Section 230, obviously, uh, again, no time to get into that, but that's one to watch. Uh, the other thing is to keep in mind that the use of social media varies greatly by age. Uh, if I'm talking with my students and they're undergrads, I know they're on TikTok. If they're grad students, they might be on Snapchat and Instagram. If I'm talking with fellow faculty, they're probably on Facebook and Twitter. So social media is not a reach-all, and please don't ever make the mistake that the social media useful to you is the one that's useful to uh, uh, people you're trying to communicate with. Um, big news yesterday. New York Times started its TikTok delivery feed. Think about that for a second. New York Times is now delivering news on TikTok. OK, telephony. I don't have to say anything about telephony. You already know everything about 5G. You know about fixed wireless. Um, I just want to emphasize these last two points. From my perspective, studying the technology, watching consumers, 5G is being used much more as a marketing tool than a technology tool. Um, and the misinformation is rampant. The claims of what 5G is doing or what it, and what it can do is one thing, but claims of here's why we're doing all of this, you know. Leading to, uh, I think, uh, it's going to be an erosion of some credibility and trust in the long run. You can't push too far, but that's just my opinion. Um, little details. Uh, I do want to emphasize 
we have almost completed the change. It used to be telephones were attached to places. You had a home phone, you had a work phone. Every store had a phone. Now phones are attached to people. Sociologically, that is a fundamental change in the technology that we have to appreciate. Um, young users are not talking on the phone. They will text, they will use apps, they'll send pictures, lots of instas back and forth. But uh, as far as picking up the phone and saying, hey, Cheryl, you'll never guess who I saw, that would never be a phone call. That would be a text. So keep that in mind. Oh, and keep in mind that your telephone device is being used as a tracking device. Uh, by both retail and digital signage, they're looking at uh, any, whether it's the Wi-Fi, whether it's the, uh, uh, the phone network, and people are trying to detect what the phones are doing so they can track you anytime, anywhere. Eventually, this may be an issue for those of you in the uh, uh, industry to address. How do you address the privacy concerns? I don't know the answer, but I know that uh, it's big. Um, AI. We've all heard about chat and GPT. Uh, I want to say one word about that, and that's Geigo. Chat GPT gets its answers from scraping the internet. So half the time when you ask Chat GPT to answer a complicated question, that answer is going to include nonsense, because there's a lot of nonsense on the internet. Um, that doesn't mean that AI won't improve. This is the buzzword of the year so far. Um, we, again, we have a very deep dive in the book uh, on AI and different types of AI. Uh, but I just, as you're looking at chat GPT, just think Geigo. So, um, OK, surveillance. I talked about the, this is what I led with last year. Rockwell. I always feel like somebody's watching me. This is where I'm told never sing again. Um, everything you do everywhere you're being seen. It's not just your cameras. The fact that I'm carrying around a cell phone means that I can be tracked. Uh, the fact that I get in a car and that car knows what I'm doing. I just, uh, uh, I love my fancy Ford Mach-E because I like driving electric and charging with the solar cells on my roof. I got a new privacy note from Ford the other day that basically said, you have to realize we're tracking you everywhere you go, everywhere you drive, everything you do. This is part of our privacy. <clears throat> I don't know that I'm comfortable with that, with Ford doing it, but I love the car. Love the car. Um, law enforcement wants access. You know the way you solve crimes with cameras? You go backwards. You don't go forwards from the camera. You say, where did the person come from? You always go backwards and you can solve the crime if you have the cameras. Marketing. How do we reach people? How do we, how do we identify people so they can be greeted? Um, stalking. Again, the number of people who have uh, misused air tags uh, is legion. So, um, oh, I love this. I just love this headline. Students rebel against heat-seeking crotch monitor surveillance devices. Basically, there was a university that was hiring students to do work on computers, and it wanted to monitor how much time they were spending at the computers. So it put sensors under the desk that would monitor whether there was a heat source where the chair was. Yes. And of course, the students found out about it, and they hacked the hell out of it. It was uh, just. It's my favorite headline from the last year. Um, we, uh, we shared this headline on our social media thing. Uh, very quickly, Internet of Things, we have a standard now, Matter. Matter will help enable more Internet of Things, more interoperability. That means things will be more connected, a lot more bandwidth probably inside a building, inside a home or a business. Um, Again, we have the interoperability. We have so many types of networking. And people keep, at the LG exhibit at CES, woman, come in, I want you to see our new refrigerator. The door changes color. You know, I don't need a networked refrigerator. But I do, I do like the idea that maybe my phone can someday control my TV better. 
Um, my last thing, this is one that is not in the book, and I'm just, after CES, I said, I gotta talk a minute about this. Everything needs to be powered. And we can get our power, if we're wired, we can pull it, you know, pull AC power, pull power through the USB connection, or even put little amounts through ethernet. But there's a lot of devices we want to connect wirelessly. And right now, battery is the only source of power. I saw two types of things that I wanted to draw your attention to. First is wireless power, literally transmission, transmitting power through uh, the air using RF. Uh, it's very low, very short distance. I don't think that's a good technology long term. But the idea of energy harvesting, the idea that we are surrounded by ambient energy, we have light energy, we have heat energy, we have motion. You know, I remember my first Timex watch was a self-winding watch had a way of capturing the energy of motion. Um, this is an emerging thing. If you're looking to get out of what you're doing and find the cutting edge, I think energy harvesting, how do we take ambient energy to power the small devices? Uh, there's a small revolution coming there. Um, we provide daily updates on uh, social media. This is our Twitter and Facebook handle, Comtech Update. Uh, and though I say daily updates, it's one a day on weekdays that just give, hey, here's something we think is interesting. Um, so that's all I have except I want to give two of these away, but instead of giving away asking questions, I'll let you ask the questions. So if you ask a question that I can answer, you get a book. So any questions? <laughs> Oh, there's one other thing. Oh, and by the way, um, can you put up the uh, Rafik Anadol's page? I asked uh, Miguel to put up Rafik's, uh, uh, some of his uh, artwork while we're doing this. Okay, the question. Um, opine whether broadband should or should not be a utility. It should be a utility. Uh, definition of utility is what is something we all either need or should have that benefits all of us. The biggest thing behind broadband is the more users you have, the more useful it is for everyone. So from that perspective, it is a utility. And there's been some great research done out of the LBJ School right here at UT that uh, justifies that. Um, I'm losing her name, I'm sorry. Uh, done back in the 90s, so okay, we had a question? I want to ask on that, uh, on the recognition when you, for the, for the media when you go in. Here, hang on, hang on. Why don't you go ahead and say your name and the company. Okay. Mike, Mike Huerta with AWSCom. So on the recognition when they do these, this are on their reading when you go into these stores and looking at you. The digital people, who's actually gathering that data and do they sell that data? Is it reused or is it? specific to one company? There are a number of different companies. It's the, uh, from what I have read, and again, I'm not into the ecosystem deeply, the shopping centers started out doing it because they wanted to track the people walking through the shopping malls. So they could use the uh, phone ID to see when people walk in, what is, where do they come in, what is the path, and then if they make a purchase, you can connect it. So right now, it's a very rudimentary ecosystem. So they haven't developed it as, as much, to my knowledge. But it's coming. And I, I need to stress, it's not just phone that can do that. You can do that with facial recognition, too. So uh, just phone is, phone is more insidious um, because nobody tells you that they're doing it. in now when you're looking at recognize if you have a if you have a uh, Nike shirt on or a fishing shirt on or and it and it tries to lead you toward buying a drink or persuade you the screen actually comes up and changes immediately just as soon as you stand there that quick yeah that's that's actually one of the big things in digital signage is yep. using the cameras to detect who's watching and then showing something that according to yep. that image they think yep. that person might like we got time for one more question yeah. I'm Ruben Miranda with Kroll. Uh, you know, you, you brought up some questions about the economics of streaming, and I'm, I'm under the impression that's 
the economics include a subscription cost that goes with that. So is there the economics change when you're talking about uh, zero cost, zero subscriber cost, and if you're just talking about, you know, a free ad supported TV service like a, like a Roku, as opposed to, you know, the monthly subscription fees? Yeah, yeah, the uh, economics change drastically because when you have ad support, um, the it, that indirect cost recovery or the indirect pricing causes you to have a, a need for a much larger audience. With direct pricing, you can make money from a smaller audience. So the presumption is when you go with advertiser support, you're trying to deal with a much larger base because there is no guarantee that you'll get any revenue from any specific customer. The goal is across hundreds or thousands of customers, you will get enough revenue to pay for the advertising. But um, this, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, television shopping started out uh, on cable and then the, tel the Home Shopping Network bought a number of TV stations. And they made more money getting one and two ratings because people were buying things and they had that direct flow of money than the broadcast stations who were airing commercials and then selling access to that audience to advertisers. So it's that indirect that uh, makes a big difference. So again, smaller audience, especially in a startup phase, subscription is much more efficient. But Netflix now has a large enough user base. If it decides to add a little bit of advertising, that's just going to be gravy on top. And the I interesting thing for Netflix, they're going to start out only with the ads to the um, minor tiers, you know, the low cost tiers, eventually everybody will have some ads because they want the money. Question. On competition in the market, you talked about Facebook or Meta, right, and antitrust issues. Maybe you can talk about Google also and, and the suits that were just dropped? Um, I don't think Google's in a good place. Google started out, uh, Google started out as a great search engine that had no way to monetize it, and somebody had the great idea of AdWords that how do we take and use the same engine that we have to uh, uh, deliver the search results, how do we deliver ads? And that was successful beyond their wildest dreams because those ads were always contextual, they always related to whatever a person was searching for, and they, were not, uh, they didn't interrupt the flow and there were immediate measures of effectiveness. So Google became the most valuable media company in the world for that. But they used that money to then buy DoubleClick, which did the uh, placement of um, uh, the banner advertising and a number of other advertising firms. So now Google has a domination in search. They're more than 60% of search and other types of advertising, they're around 40%. So yes, I think the, those suits have a very good chance of being successful in paring down the uh, market dominance of Google. Uh, comment. Uh, that's the oh, util. I don't see anything after utility. That's okay. By the way, we appreciate seeing all of you online. This is this makes it fun. Although you're going to miss the lobster lunch today. <laughs> All right, we'll tell you what, if you have individual questions, I don't want to get, get off time here because Larry, Larry needs his time. So. <laughs> you know, if, if we had a way to just drop the book in, uh, we do that. But uh, we do, you know, the book is for sale. If it's something you think you can find uh, useful because it does provide overviews and it's 27 chapters on individual media technologies, computers, consumer electronics, social media, telephony, all that. Um, Amazon has it for uh, $50 now. The regular price is like $69.95. I think Helen Mary has a stack of them back there. If you want to take one with you, we'll sell it for $25. So, um, anyway, and if you want an autographed copy, 
<laughs> we'll take care of that too. Anyway, thanks so much. Thank you, Augie.